Brian Ledette is finished in a moment, is over to my right, your left, is a standings microphone, so feel free to ask him any questions. He's got a lot of wisdom to share with us, Brian Ledette, Dr. Brian Ledette from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry here. He, he and our next presenter, uh, Sarah Vaughn and Tangamani, are you often pictured, if you see them in photographs, out in the wild somewhere. They're uh, either forest or they're collecting uh, bugs or they're talking about these bugs, these ticks, because they happen to be experts uh, at it. And Brian's lab has combined extensive field work along with lab methods to try to understand what drives these tick-borne diseases and the ecological factors uh, that, that do the same. And he's expanded his lab recently, and he is certainly an expert in the ticks that bring these diseases, how to identify them, and how to try to help us prevent them from getting to your patients. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Brian Ledette. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, it's uh, I'm the first talk, so I get the rest of the the conference off. Um, but uh, so I'm Brian Ledette. I'm a professor at SUNY ESF, um, and um, we're going to talk about ticks because they're the problem for this whole conference, right? Without them, we wouldn't be here. Make sure I can go the right direction. Maybe. Let me see. It's on. Let me just ask me to advance on my group. Sure, 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 sure. Maybe it's it. <laughs> I'm a walker. I don't even need the microphone. All right, let's go ahead and advance the slide, please. All right, so. Ticks are nothing new, um, uh, and I, I want you to know this is not. I've been I've been studying for fifteen years, but they've been around since the dinosaurs. This is a, a tick that caught in amber. I mean, remember the, the movie Jurassic Park? That's how that started. Um, they should have used the tick, but they used a mosquito. I'm not going to uh, 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 Nick knock them for that. Advance again, please. And with ticks came disease. And if you remember Otzi the Iceman, right? Everybody remembers Otzi. Well, they actually found remnants of Borrelia spirochetes, which is the causative agent of Lyme disease in Otzi's joints. So again, this is nothing new. We've, been, we've known about this for a long time. Please advance. And what has really sped up our understanding of tick-borne diseases is the science, right? And this is a, a kind of a, a graph showing the last century or uh, century and the discovery of different tick-borne diseases. You can see on this end, we've really seen an increase in the last 20 years on the recognition of novel diseases which means it is not slowing down. And 20 or 30 years from now, this is gonna be well expanded and we, we really need to be ahead of this. And I would argue that we are not. Please advance. In New York state, there's a, a host of tick-borne diseases that you could be exposed to. Um, most of us are really well aware of it. We'll talk about a lot of these during this conference. There's a def definitely great diversity during this conference. Please advance. Um, but. Lyme is by far one is the, by far the most common tick-borne disease in in the northern hemisphere. Um, it is estimated around five hundred thousand cases annually in the United States, costing over one billion dollars in costs. And there's thirteen states that are responsible for about ninety five percent of these cases. New York is one of them, as we are all well aware. Please advance. In New York State, I've divided it into regions. I'm going to present the data from each uh, region. Please advance. And we can see. Uh, please advance that in the southern New York state, uh, we've actually, we see a lot of cases, but cases have actually been plateauing off, please advance, if not decreasing in, in percentages. And we've seen really precipitous increase in western and northern New York by indicated by these bar graphs and the percent increase in cases over two, four year periods, please advance. Now it is 9.18 in the morning um, on a Thursday. It's a beautiful day, please advance. And I'd like to do some math. I'm not a mathematician, but this is easy math, trust me. Please advance. I'm going to introduce the Lyme disease equation. This could be any tick-borne disease equation. So let's talk about the tick, advance, plus the host, advance, plus the bacteria, the virus, the protozoan. Listen, folks can't hear you well. The, oh, I apologize, Zoom folks. Does this? Okay. I like moving. Tina, I don't know how to turn this on. I got it. 
Hello? Yay. The bacteria, the protozoa, the virus, the autoimmune reaction, the hypersensitivity. Please advance. Plus the human. Please advance. Equals the clinical presentation of the disease. Now, remember this equation. I'll be testing you later, but we'll talk about it later on in my talk. So please advance. Let's break this equation apart and talk about the tick, because that's what I am an expert in. Ticks look different. They look very different to me. Most people say they look the same to me, um, but they don't. And there's a couple of ticks that we need to worry about really biting humans in upstate New York. Please advance. And that is the black-legged tick, also known as the deer tick, the one that does cause Lyme disease, as well as the as dermocenter variabilis, variabilis, or the dog tick. And this is responsible for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, as, long as, as well as some other um, um, diseases. Please advance. But again, I'm going to focus on the most common tick you're going to see in practice or your patients are going to come to you with, and that is the, the black-legged tick or exodi scapularis. Please advance. Talking about the, the bacteria itself, Borrelia burgdorferi, please advance. And the host that basically carry this bacteria in nature and perpetuate this in nature. Please advance. So let's talk about the tick. Please advance. Ticks seek out hosts, they seek out blood meals, and they do it through two strategies. <clears throat> One is the ambush strategy, which is demonstrated here. This tick is climbing up a piece of grass and putting out its front legs, looking for a host to come by to grab onto, climb up, and bite you. Please advance. The black-legged tick does that. We have another tick in downstate New York uh, that practices the hunter-style tick, and this is the lone star tick. This will chase you for about three meters to try to run after you. They're not as quick as I am, but if you're a slow runner, they, they may be able to catch up to you and bite you. Please advance. What are they looking for? Looking for a few things. Odorants, um, human odorants, uh, host odorants, CO2, what we breathe off, animal breath, ammonia, butic, lactic acid, things your, your muscles are, are giving off. I put a picture of a dead deer here because we see this in upstate New York. Now, they're not, they're not seeking dead animals, but there is a tick that actually uh, goes to carcasses waiting for scavengers to come by and get onto the carnivore scavenger. Please advance. Looking for heat, radiant heat. Warm-blooded mammals are warm against a dark background. Please advance. Vibrations. I love this slide. I, I can't find a deer making a vibration uh, as a clip art, so I have an elephant. But not to be saying uh, elephants are not, uh, are not alone with humans. Please advance. They have their own elephant tick. This is an elephant tick. tick. Uh, please advance. And then uh, sounds. Actually, some uh, uh, ticks have evolved to actually respond to the host sound, whether it's the oscillation of a of a cow chewing or the bark of a dog. Please advance. And then pheromones. Ticks emit pheromones like other organisms saying, hey, come here. We're going to find a meal. This is a clutch of larval ticks. One larva goes up and says, hey, let's go find them host. And all his friends follow him. Or a tick on an animal is having a blood meal saying, hey, I'm looking for a mate. Come on, let's, let's get busy. Please advance. Now, what's the life cycle of a tick? It's pretty complex. Um, so we have an adult tick here that lays eggs. Please advance. I use a lot of builds, so I'd be doing this without saying please advance. They lay between 2,000 to 10,000 larvae. Um, when it comes to Lyme disease, these larvae are not infected. Jeopardy note, larvae have six legs. Ticks are not insects. They're arachnids, so they have eight legs. Please advance. They grow eight legs when they become nymphs. We cannot tell the sex of the tick. There is no sexual dimorphism until they're adults. Please advance where we have a male and a female tick. Please advance. Now, ticks are hematophagous, meaning they feed on blood. Please advance. Ha. Please advance. Uh, and it's a pretty uh, interesting phenomena. The tick inserts its, its, its hypostome, or it's like uh, piercing uh, mouth parts into the, into the host. They have barbs that face backwards that hook them in the host. They actually release a cement to stay in that host. Please advance. And they use a cutting tool known as what there is called their chelicerate to cut into the host. Please advance. Now, um, because ticks take blood meals, um, the please advance. The blood meals are done on hosts at different life stages. So the larva has a blood meal. That's the only meal they take until they uh, they molt into nymphs. The nymphs take a blood meal. That's the only meal they take until they turn into adults. And the female takes a blood meal and lays eggs. Unlike a mosquito that bites over and over and over again or can feed on nectar, ticks have two meals, maybe three, and then die. Please advance. So we think about sickness. Um, like I said earlier, please advance. If a female is sick, larvae are not sick. So where do ticks get infected? Well, they get infected feeding on small mammals. And we'll talk later why that's important. The mouse is sick, please advance. The nymphs will be sick, please advance. And then can, they can feed an uninfected mouse and they'll still carry that infection. So this is this infection. Once the tick's infected, they'll carry it to the adulthood. So that adult can still transmit disease. Please advance. 
Now, let's say the larva feed on a non-infected animal. They're not infected, obviously. The nymph can feed on an infected animal and the, and the parents are infected. So there's two stages a tick can become infected. Please advance. Now, we're talking about Lyme disease. Please advance. I think you've seen this slide. Um, what has happened? Why are we seeing this increase? Well, I, I'll, I'll kind of put some of the major hypotheses there forward. But we as col uh, most of us as colonizers, the history of the United States, we had a colonization event in the 1600s, and we hunted deer to near extinction. This is a graph of all the deer population in the United States. By 1900, there were almost no deer left. We realized that's not a good idea. We brought deer back uh, to, to near, near, um, near levels pre-colonization. Please advance. We also deforested the whole United States. And this is an example of continuous forest. Moving from 1600, we're cutting down trees to build, cutting down trees for fire. By 1910, we said, we're doing wrong. We need to bring the forest back. We bring the forest back. Please advance but is not this forest. You do not see this forest in many parts of the United States. Please advance. You see this forest. That is not a healthy forest. I can tell you I work at ESF, um, so trust me. This is called fragmentation. And why is that important for disease? Please advance. We know ticks live in forests. A fragmented forest looks like this. A non-fragmented forest looks like this. Please advance. And that changes what we call edge habitat. Please advance. You can fit more people on more edge than people on this edge. So that leads us to this conflict between humans, wildlife, and their ticks. Increased conflict. Please advance. Now, in with the increasing edge, we also have these large forests. Don't these smaller forests don't support? Please advance. The same mammal community structure. A virgin forest has a very harmonious structure of apex predators. Deer, omni, you know, different trophic levels, uh, mice, and they're all in a nice homeostasis or balance. Please advance. Fragmented forests support generalists that really survive in a peri domestic environment. They're feeding on your trash. They're feeding on your ornamentals. You've got a bunch of coyotes. You got tons of mice in your house. Please advance, and that really drives Lyme disease and tick-borne disease transmission. Now, on top of what I've just said, this is occurring. Does anybody know what this is? These are gardening zones, right? This is like, if you're in upstate New York, when do you put your tomatoes out, right? Now, why do I put this up here? Well, because climate change is, is changing everything about this planet. Please advance. And I like to comp I like to talk about trees and plants because I'm at ESF. Um, and there's a reason in upstate New York, we do not have coconuts. We, we don't have orange trees. I'm sorry, Syracuse. Uh, and we don't have banana trees. And that's because we don't have the right growing conditions to get from the seed, which is in the fruit, to the full tree. And why do I say that? Well, please advance. I like to compare the tick to a seed, right? You have a seed tick, huh, no pun intended, people call them seed ticks, and they're exposed 95% of their life, they're in the environment, just like a seed from a plant. And to get from this seed to a fully fed fruit that I would not eat, um, it takes time and it takes environmental conditions that are that that make this thing happen. It's a two-year life cycle. I'm not going to go through this, but as climate change occurs, we're seeing these conditions become right in novel areas. So maybe one day we will have orange trees in upstate New York. Please advance. Where do ticks live? Um, ticks live almost everywhere. I'm going to focus on the black-legged tick. Um, black-legged ticks really like forested areas. They're very prone to drying out, um, so they like this leaf litter that is degrading, that is producing a duff layer. It's moist, it's warm, it's wonderful for them. Um, so they live in these deciduous forests with broad leaves. Um, they, they're not in the middle of the trail where they're drying out. They, they can drop off there, but they'll die eventually. Please advance. And when we think about yards, they're, a lot of these black legged tickets at least are not in the middle of the yard. They're on what we call ecotones, on the edge habitat. If they do drop off here, they can live for a little bit. D don't get me wrong, you can get a tick in the middle of your front yard. Um, but that tick will not survive as long as other ticks in, in here. Please advance. So how do ticks survive? I get this question a lot. We have a bad winter, Dr. Ledet. What's What, what does a tick population look like? Ticks are fine. Ticks take two years to, in ideal conditions, can live for two years. Please advance. In the winter, please advance. They live in tick igloos. Um, underneath the snowpack, when you step on the snow and it crunches, it has that little bit of ice layer because the 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 warmth of the the soil underneath is melting the snow and that's re freezing just like an igloo right you can put a fire in an igloo and you'll be fine um same thing happening in that duff layer those ticks are down there and they're they're happy they 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 they're they're living in what we call microclimate please advance 
So if you see a snowpack like this, people don't have, these people don't have to worry about ticks. I don't know what they're doing. They're camping in the middle of the winter, but please advance. However, as soon as you see a snow melt, you see the ground, you need to be concerned. Please advance. Coming to the host, we talked about the tick. What about the host? So the black-legged tick is a generalist tick. It feeds on a lot of different hosts, and hosts are very important. I'll kind of hint on why that is. Um, they're part of the equation. Remember that if you take them out, the equation doesn't exist. Um, one thing I like to stress is that deer do not carry Lyme disease. They're actually refractory to infection. The deer are essential for the cycle because you will never find an adult tick on a small mammal. The adult ticks do not, you, can, you literally cannot, well, you can force if they're really hungry, but they won't be very happy. So mice do not carry the adult tick. The adult tick feeds on large and medium-sized mammals. So if you don't have deer or other larger animals and just a bunch of mice running around, you don't have a tick problem. Please advance. But not all hosts are created equal. So this is a, a graphical representation of some science, and red is bad. So mice, we think about them as the, the bad guys here. They're very good at infecting ticks and a lot of them. You go down the spectrum here, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse over to this end. So when you think about host communities, please advance, they differ. And you don't have to worry about looking at the data here. Just know that these graphs are all different colors because wh wherever you go in the country, in the world, host structure differs. And that affects ticks and ultimately disease. Please advance. Importantly, this is a really cool study done from um, uh, Dutchess County uh, down at uh, the Cary Institute. They found that predators really affect disease. And uh, please advance. And again, this is all science, but I'm going I'm to lay it out really simple for you. The more diverse a predator community up here, possums, foxes, bobcats, uh, you know, all these things, what we see is decreasing what is up here is nymphal infection prevalence, infection prevalence in the nymphs, as well as decreased disease prevalence of diseases like Lyme, Babesia, Anaplasma. Please advance. And when you get a disturbed community where coyotes come in and kick everybody out, we see increasing in tick-borne diseases. And that's a very complex thing my lab is working to find to figure out. Please advance. Now let's talk about humans, because ultimately in that equation, we're the problem. If we weren't here, we wouldn't have disease, right? No, we wouldn't have disease because we wouldn't be here. Wouldn't be doctors, it wouldn't be anybody. So let's talk about humans, please advance. Where do we encounter ticks? Um, you can encounter ticks where ticks, I tell people encounter ticks where ticks are and not where they're not. They're like, well, that makes sense. I'm like, well, of course it does. So if you're in a parking lot, you're not gonna encounter a tick. But if you're in the woods, you're gonna encounter a tick. And they're like, well, why do we always encounter a tick on trail edges? I'm like, well, that's because you're worried that's where you're walking, you know? <laughs> If I'm on a trail, I'm walking on the trail. I'm not my kid walking over here in the brush. You can encounter ticks over here, but you're not walking over there. Um, the other place we spend a lot of time is in our yard. Where do we encounter ticks? On the edge of our yard where the ticks are and where we are. Please advance. It's very simple, but science has shown that 70% of New York residents encounter ticks in their yard likely. Please advance. Let's talk about transmission of Lyme. I'm not going to talk a lot about disease because we have a lot more smarter people in the audience that are going to be talking about this than me. But I do like to show this slide because it highlights my ability to draw and be an artist. Please advance. Not very good. But I will, I, this, I, I actually, I, this was from my PhD dissertation. I did this when I defended my PhD. This is a tick. This is a mouse. And this is blood. These are not ears. These are salivary glands. This is not spaghetti, this is its stomach. And that's what the stomach looks like. And these are little spirochetes, the Borrelia spirochetes. So when a tick takes a blood meal, please advance. The blood comes in and the spirochetes go, ooh, something is changing in, the, in here. Please advance. And they start increasing in numbers. They get very active. Some of them get through the stomach into the hemolymph, which is the circulatory system, please advance. And few get into the salivary glands, please advance. Those then can get into the host and it's very, few number of spirochetes that get into the host. Now, importantly, I love to show physicians and healthcare providers this because we always talk about, well, you know, Lyme disease, 24 hours. Well, why? This is why. Please advance. It takes time for this to happen. The tick doesn't start throwing up as soon as it bites somebody. So this is where you can educate the patient like, why? And you're like, oh, I don't know. It's, I, someone told me 24 hours. Boom. You got you to gotta educate it here. If you remember anything, here you go. Please advance. All right. Infection occurs, I'm not gonna go through here, but the spirochetes get in the tissue, they disseminate, sometimes causing a rash, they get into the vascular system, and then they disseminate to different tissues. They don't stay in the blood very long, we'll hear a lot about that. I'm not gonna uh, harp on this, please advance. 
Climate change, I said, is, is important for tick development, but it's important for a lot of other things. Climate change affects everything. It affects the number of babies a mouse has, how many litters it has, um, when deer are active or not active, when we are outside, how long we're outside, if we're enjoying the weather. It has a lot of effects. It's not as simple as just the seed to fruit. Please advance. So in New York State, again, this is the list of tick-borne diseases. Please advance. The black-legged tick can transmit these diseases, and as you will hear later, they can transmit multiple diseases, diseases at a time. Other ticks can transmit these other diseases. You will have these slides to, available for you. Um, please advance. Back to the equation, back to math. You're like, oh, Brian, math, it's, it's 9, 9.35. Um, let's talk about this equation because this is where we're gonna tackle Lyme disease or any other tick-borne disease. If you don't have one part of this equation, you don't have this. You don't have here, please advance. So let's take apart each part of this equation to decrease or get rid of disease. So let's talk about the tick because that's what I like. I love the tick. Please advance. How do we get rid of the tick? Well, there's a couple of different ways. You may have heard of tick tubes. Anyone heard of tick tubes? I know it's early, but you've already done math. So you're warmed up. Tick tubes. Yes, tick tubes are really interesting. Theoretically, logically, man, they make sense. You can go to Home Depot and buy these things. Please don't. Please don't, because they don't work. Basically, it's a tube that has cotton in it, that has a, 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 a permethrin or a caricide that kills ticks. And the little mice take the cotton and they make these cute little nests and their pups are delivered and all the ticks are clear. That seems to work, right? I could sell a million of these things, right? Oh, yeah, that's going to cure Lyme disease. You, it's great. Please go. Advance, please. Um, unless you only have mice in your yard, which anybody only have mice in their yard? Mice use cotton. This bird, the song sparrow that has 36 engorged ticks on it, doesn't care about that cotton. Fox doesn't use cotton. Little cute little chipmunk doesn't use cotton. Shrew doesn't care about cotton. So if you have a very monoculture yard with only paramiscus and deer and ticks, buy all the tick tubes you want, you will have some control but you don't have that. So um, not a very good strategy. Please advance. What about these? Anybody heard about the four poster treatment stations? They, do, they use these Pennsylvania, downstate New York. Neat, neat, great philosophy. So you have this, this station that feeds deer corn. There's corn in here. And you have these paint rollers that have the same type of a caricide that just like the cotton. And the deer come up and they feed and it rolls their ears where the, where the ticks are and it kills all the ticks. And it, it actually has been shown to be somewhat effective um, because deer are important, right? They feed the majority of the adults. You kill the adults. You don't have the babies. You can kind of interrupt that cycle. Please advance. These are really expensive. It takes uh, one of these takes about costs about fifteen thousand dollars a year to maintain, and you can't just have one for a city the size of Syracuse. So pretty cost prohibitive. Please advance. Lawn sprays. Let's spray our yard. And I love these sides. Because please don't spray your yard when your dog's playing in it with the with with chemicals. Um, but there are certain chemicals out there. There's do-it-yourself sprays. There's commercial sprays. Um, please advance. But there are some pros, right? Synthetic chemicals really do work. I, I will tell you right now that if you spray your yard with a synthetic chemical, you're going to kill ticks. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. But it's a synthetic chemical, and it's not specific to ticks. So it'll kill your bumblebees. It'll kill all the insects in your yard. Um, so there is a downside to that. Synthetic chemicals are also made to persist in the environment. They're, a chemist goes and says, how can I make this last as long as possible? That's what they do. They work, but they're very toxic. In aquatic systems, they can really damage aquatic ecosystems. Some require that specialized equipment, whether it's high pressure sprays or targeted knowledge of where you're spraying it. Some of the safer, non-toxic or the, the more natural chemicals, you may have heard of cedar oil or stuff, they do have some effect, but they re require multiple applications throughout the year because they're not made by chemists saying, stay there as long as possible, right? They're safe. So they degrade by UV, by rain. So they can work. And I do advise um, for targeted spraying will help your yard if you're seeing an issue. But you do not just nuke your yard with bifenthrin. Um, please advance. All right. So I don't think we're getting when the tick gets here, we're not getting rid of it. I'm sorry. Uh, we don't have technology yet to get rid of that tick. So once it gets here, we're in trouble. So what about hosts? Can we do something about the hosts? Please advance. Um, Syracuse tries deer culling. Um, the problem is Syracuse needs to cull about 100 times more deer than they actually cull to make any effect, at least in the literature. 
Um, so while it can work on an island, it probably will not work in an environment where deer free range and roam. Please advance. So hosts are not going to work. There's no way you're killing all the mice either. I, I didn't put that up. That's a that's kind of a, a no brainer. Um, I can't get them out of my house. It's, it's been a bad year this year. So what about the 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 the, the pathogen? Please advance. Well, there are some candidates out there to reduce the pathogen from that equation. There is an edible mouse Lyme vaccine where they, they, they target these pellets, they put a, a vaccine on it, and they spread this in the environment. Um, it, actually, this has worked in the past. We've done it for rabies. We've really re reduced rabies by targeting the host, right? Your, your dogs, your cats, raccoons in nature. So it's, it's been done in a case study series. There's actually, if you want to look something up scary, they're actually a, 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 an investigator at MIT is, is, is proposing to, to release genetically modified mice um, on Nant Nantucket Island um, to see if they can kill the spirochete in the tick. Now, there's a really funny Stephen Colbert episode if you want to watch about that. He does a really good job at that. Um, so look it up. Uh, uh, please advance. But again, the host. Those are mice. You got all these other players here. So unless you take it as a holistic approach, the mice are not the answer. Please advance. All right. What do we do now? Well, we're left with one more thing. <laughs> Please advance. Yeah, get rid of us. Some people would say that's really good. A lot of people in my college would say, yeah, humans are bad. Uh, I'm not saying uh, a, a mass genocide or anything like that. That's, that's not cool. Um, but please advance. But we can take us out of the equation, right? Uh, prevention through education. And there is a significant examples of this in public health. And I'm a public health trained person. Please advance. How many people brush your teeth this morning? Everybody raise your hand, please. I don't want to. Good, good. Fluoride reduces dental caries. Please advance. Sunscreen, your kids, yourselves, reduces melanoma. Please advance. Seatbelts. When I was a kid, and I'm not that old, it, you know, we didn't, we weren't always wearing seatbelts. If I forget to buckle my son, Lucas, in, he's like, Daddy, seatbelt. I'm like, yes, yes, that's what we need to do. We need to change a generation to think that that's normal, to think prevention is normal. Please advance. So what do you do for prevention of tick-borne diseases? How do we change the next generation? Proper clothing, light pants tucked into your socks, mainly because ticks attach at lower extremities and they climb up. So you find a tick on your head, it has climbed all the way up there and bit you. If it has to climb on the outside of your clothes, you can see it, brush it off. Please advance. Using of DEET or caricides like permethrin. This is used on clothes. This is used on exposed skin. You can buy clothes with, with permethrin already done. This is very good. This actually kills ticks. This repels ticks. Um, you can find, you follow directions, please. I'm not going to go through the specifics. If you're more interested in uh, uh, more natural uh, sprays, you can go to epa.gov. They have approved sprays. Um, please visit this website. Again, you will have this link. Please advance. Tick checks and showers. If you don't want to do any of that, at least do this. If you are outside and you see grass, trees, or anything, and you're in it, as soon as you get inside that afternoon, please check yourself for ticks. Take a shower. If the tick hasn't attached, it comes off. You should take a shower anyway. You're sweaty. You should do it. Take your clothes. Put it in the dryer for 10 minutes. It will heat and kill the tick. Tick checks. Areas where ticks feed. The waist. The armpits. Everywhere. Your face. Look for that spot that's not supposed to be there. Have somebody help you. Have your kid have a tick check chart. Give them a sticker for every tick check you do, right? My son loves his stickers for his tick checks and then a, a prize or whatever, just like potty training, right? We've all gone through that. I have a two-year-old, I'll be going through it soon. Again, please advance. What do you do around the house? Well, this is where you're most exposed. So you can make areas, alert your children, alert your loved ones of where ticks exist. A lot of this stuff is, is it may not be the silver bullet, but in, an integrative approach helps. Make no-go zones. Uh, you have a barrier here where you say, kids, beyond that, there's a risk for ticks. So if you go play over there, we really need to tick check you, right? Keep your lawn mowed. Um, keep your garden away from swing sets, wood, rock piles, stone walls where mice live. Keep them away for where your kids are playing. Um, you have this list here. You can go on the CDC to see it. You will also have this in uh, available to you. Please advance. And then what happens if you get a tick? Because you will. I, I promise you, you will. Can we play this video? If you click on it, please. So this video I took, my wife called me. Right um, there. This is a nipple black tick right, in my so wife. My grip is okay. close to the skin as possible. Just like that. And gently pull out. All done. This is very easy. It scares people. There's no mouth parts in my wife. This, this was gotten in my front yard in 20 minutes. 
apologize for my wife in her pajamas after a shower. Um, there's a nymphal black legged tick crawling on my hands. And the tweezers are out here for you. Great tweezers to do this. There's a plug for the, the, the agency that I'm a board member on. And it works. My wife did a chick check. She called me. She goes, Brian. I'm like, well, is there something wrong? She goes, kind of. <laughs> I go, it's a tick. I said, there's nothing wrong with that. Let me get my camera, my tweezers, and let's film this. Because I always get asked how to do this. So I finally got to take a video in May of this. You grab the tick. What do you do with the tick? Please do not throw it out. Please do not burn it. Please do not flush it. Save that tick. Put it in a bag. Throw it in your freezer to kill it. Send it off to be tick, tick tested through multiple different tick testing agencies. If you get sick, bring that tick to the doctor with you. That's evidence to help with differential diagnosis. Um, we have uh, uh, CNY Lyme Alliance has a lot of good information for you. I am a resource for Central New York. I am here. I'm a state employee. I am here to help you. You will have my contact information. Please reach out. Please reach out to the Alliance. Please advance. If you get sick, you guys are all physicians. I'm not. You know how you know this. You, you will learn more about this. But recognition of symptoms early is key. Flu-like symptoms in the summer is not the flu. Um, please advance. Recognition of tick-borne infection by the healthcare provider very important. But the, you need your patient to be honest with you. And bringing the tick is really important. If it, they walk in with a tick, you're like, okay, I'm going to think about tick-borne diseases. Please advance. Early antibiotics for uh, multiple bacterial infections. There's viral infections. And again, smarter people will talk about that later. Please advance. And there's a vaccine on the on the way. It's in phase three trials. There's I'm, about five years, I would, I'd estimate. But uh, Dr. Chris Polino will probably tell, tell you more about it. Please advance. All right. I want to end with this uh, saying by Ralph Waldo Emerson, research is fundamentally a state of mind in, involving continual reexamination of doctrines and axioms upon which current thought and action are based. It is therefore critical of existing practice. In the 1800s, we believed that disease was caused by bad air. And it made sense because we drained swamps and we cured malaria. That's not what causes bad air is not it. So we as scientists are always questioning what we see around us. Please advance. My lab at SUNY F's doing things in the environment. I just wanted to give a plug. There's me, I'm, I'm not important. Um, Theo's doing some predator studies, which is really exciting. I can't wait to see that out. Zoe, my new master's students doing novel detection methods. And Sam is burning ticks with fire down in Long Island. I can't wait to burn some ticks. Please advance. Uh, I have to take any questions right now. My contact information is here. This is Lucas, my dancing Lena two-year-old. And uh, please reach out and I'll be around the whole conference. Come talk to me, I love talking. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Questions in case there's a, unless there's a camera, I can bring this microphone to you. Just raise your hand and let me know that you got a question for the first one, way across the room. That's good. But Brian's keeping his mic so he can answer it. And I'm going to turn this one off in case people stand at the podium. There's no. Sure. Oh, no. I didn't plant this question. <laughs> Brian, so one of the things that comes up a lot in the clinic is some of the environmental questions, right? So you mentioned like keeping your grass short, like how short is short? Um, are there any landscaping companies in the area that, you know, SUNY ESF might recommend? I'm a state employee, so that would it be a violation of ethics? So, is is there any is there anything from that standpoint that we can do? And then the other thing, which is um, a separate thing, people don't seem to trust me when I tell them that don't ticks don't don't fly, don't jump, don't fall out of trees. Can you just comment on that? Yeah, my mom said that, and I said, "Mom, you're wrong." She goes, "No, I'm not." I said, "Mom, I'm an expert. Um, ticks do not jump or fly or jump off trees. They climb up little small branches and grab onto you." Period. Um, that that's it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. And if anybody believes they fly, please let me know because ticks are arachnids and they do not have wings. Um, insects have wings and they have six legs. Um, as far as how short to cut your grass, it doesn't, I mean, short is shorter is better. Pave your front yard. That, that'll work if you want to pave everything, but rocks in your front yard. And you know, that Zarek landscape is really great. Um, but my wife got it right in my front yard. I don't have any forest near me and my, I'm living fatal right across from target. And, and there's some invasive Norway maples above my, uh, that's it. So it, they can be there. They won't survive as long in grass like that, but you can pick them up right in your front yard. So, you know, it prevention is, is important, but I really think if you don't want to tuck your pants into your socks and none of us want to do that, um, tick checks, if you can at least do that, if, if that's your seatbelt every day and, and that's the norm, that will help a lot. And that goes back to my really crappy drawing of how Lyme disease is transmitted, right? Six hours on you, it really reduces your risk of disease transmission. My, my pants into my, when I mow my lawn and I don't have a hot, large lawn. Questions, others right here, we'll start with you. 
No hard ones, Monica. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. It's a, it's a little hard, but um, I wonder if you could comment on the um, how Borrelia miyamotoi complicates mm. the equation, given that it can be transmitted faster. And oh, I, 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 I wish I could study Borrelia miyamotoi. I've been trying to. Um, so Borrelia miyamotoi is a spirochete closely related to Borrelia burgdorferi, but is a little different. It's a relapsing fever-like spirochete. Um, it's spread by the hard tick, the black-legged tick. Um, it infects the blood, so you can actually see it in the blood system. That's 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 reminiscent of a relapsing fever. Most of them are transmitted by soft ticks, but not this one. It's special. We don't know a lot about it. Um, we actually really don't know the reservoir in nature. I tried to get some money, and no one wanted to give me money to to look at the reservoir. I believe they're deer. I believe deer are 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 really are important reservoir for these. So I say deer are not important for Lyme disease. I think with really my motoy they are, um, and that they're carrying this spirochete. What's really scary is that deer are important for the adult ticks. Really, my motoy is um, transmitted from the female to the progeny, so larvae can be infected. So I say that you don't have to worry about Lyme disease with larvae. You may have to worry about Lyme disease with brilliant or, or brilliant my motoy and larvae. Um, clinically, uh, I'm not a doctor, but it's tr tr traditional relapsing fever, and uh, you could talk to Chris Polino about that. We've had a few cases in in the area. He can discuss. Um, the testing, it, it's it's different enough where you're going to see some, I would believe, some cross-reactivity, but it's not going to be conclusive. Um, and like I said, I, I would grab us on the side, grab Chris, grab me. We can discuss more about this. I think we're going to see increasing. The percentage in nature is very low right now in certain areas, like around here, uh, less than 1% of ticks. Downstate, you have areas up to 4 or 5%. Um, it is coming. We know nothing about it. It's 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 a shame. I'll try to do something about it, but my hands are tied by money or no money. Front row. Isn't this great? You get to see my two-year-old dancing. Hey, we are, oh, is this on? Yes. We've been having a lot of patients coming in and telling us that there are no local options for tick testing anymore. And I just want to be able to give them the most accurate resources. So where do you recommend that patients go for that currently? So tick testing is a, a tool, right? It's not, it's not, if that tick is test positive for Borrelia, it doesn't mean it was transmitted to you. I, I need to make that clear. Um, it, it is a tool for you and your physician to discuss clinical options. Um, <clears throat> we did have local tick testing. Uh, funding is not very good for tick testing. Um, I do, uh, Ann or Royale, do we have a link on our website for other tick testing options? Because there are company, there are not companies, but university centers that offer tick testing for a price. We, we do. Okay, so you can go to CNY Lyme Alliance. I, I won't recommend any again because I am a state employee and that would be against ethics. But there are options available in the Northeast for a modest fee uh, um, to, to get your tick tested. And again, that is a tool that you as the provider and the patient should use as information when you're looking at clinical treatment. Right here. Regarding, hello? Oh, regarding that testing, um, there's two tiers. Um, $50 will give you um, Lyme disease, but um, Bartonella doesn't come in that tier. You have to have the $100 tier. And I assume that we would recommend people get the full scope of testing done. I, I, this, this is up to the patient um, to decide. It's, it's again, this is only information for you. It's that, that data that you get from a testing center is just information for you and your provider to make a decision on treatment and clinical, you know, uh, strategy forward. That, that would be my opinion on that. Next question right here. This is hard to like, reaching over here. I'd, I'd recommend this to any provider. Uh, Hi. Hi. So you talked about with the tick preservation to put it in a bag yeah. and freezer. Is it frowned upon then to like in the past we've been advised to like tape it to an index card oh. sort of thing? Is that still acceptable or is the tick? Oh, no certainly. Longer, yeah, um, certainly. That's and that's great. But why I say freezer is because it'll kill it. Uh, if you tape it to a card, its legs are still wiggling, and you're like, oh, unless you want to show your kids, and they're cool about that. But uh, additionally, putting it in the freezer will will allow some storage. So if you do decide to have tick testing, it will it will preserve um, DNA and RNA, which which will assist in better uh, ability to detect uh, pathogens. So throw it in your freezer. If it kind of grosses you out, just put it behind something that's been sitting there for a while, like that old meat that's sitting in there. Uh, 
Um, just a little comment on that. Sure. Please don't tape it to a card because the people identifying it have a harder time because their legs get ripped off and wrap it in a paper towel to keep it I moist. I didn't know that. Look, I learned <laughs> something new. Yes, do not tape it to a card. Put it in a Ziploc bag and throw it in your freezer. Thank you. But uh, my actual question was, you said you have a student working on like predator stuff. Yes. Um, are they like looking at how predator communities like reduce deer populations and how that could potentially reduce Lyme? Or... No, uh, he, we're interested in uh, small mammal movement and how, um, because it, ticks do not, I didn't talk about this. Ticks only climb up and down. They, they very rarely walk horizontally. So to get anywhere in nature, they have to hitch a ride and it's on a mouse or a small mammal. And predators, uh, mice are afraid of predators and they change their behavior around predators. So we're looking at how we can push predators around in nature and affect ticks spatially in nature. And we have some really, really cool data this year if you want to speak about it. Sounds really interesting. Who else has a question? Hand up for Dr. Ledette. Any way of time before our next presenter. Anybody? One more. Oh, those are all softball questions. Those are easy. <laughs> How about a hand for Brian Ledette? Thank you. Thank you.